safe streets, vibrant neighborhoods, successful business and commerce. These are things that make a healthy community. We are a diverse community, rural, suburban, urban, a multitude of languages and ethnicities, ages and experiences. We are a collaborative community. Public-private partnerships make us a model community that others want to follow. It is what makes us unique. It is what makes us strong. The employees of Kent County reflect our diversity and seek to serve our communities. People in this county, in this area, we wrap our arms around each other. We come together to collaborate, to solve problems. Um, we're all working for the good of the whole. And I think that's wonderful. And you can see it. You can see it as you drive around Kent County. Our impact starts the day a baby is born and a birth certificate is issued, to protecting children from deadly diseases through vaccination, to the public safety and justice provided by law enforcement and the courts, to offering veterans services and caring for the elderly. Every day we work to keep our communities robust. I think if you are somebody who is interested in serving your community, in building a strong knowledge base and a good group of people to work with, then the county is one of your best employment opportunities out there. It's been completely rewarding in every way I could possibly explain for 26 years and I feel like I grow every single day still today. Leading these dedicated employees are 19 member board of commissioners and our county administrator controller, along with our elected officials and appointed department directors, placing emphasis on civic involvement, quality housing, vibrant neighborhoods, and strong solid infrastructure to allow businesses to thrive. Professional, dedicated, collaborative, and innovative. Behind the scenes, collaboration between foundations, charitable organizations, nonprofits, for-profit businesses, public sector demonstrated through the county, the city of Grand Rapids, the townships, all the cities and the villages in our area. If we don't come together, then we will not have the strength that we have today, and I only hope to build upon that. Our aim is to make our communities the best they can be. We are involved in exciting development projects, sustainable recycling programs, and creative progressive prevention programming. We partner with elected officials, impacting policy ideas that become great achievements. We seek opportunities to reach out into the community and offer our services to help our residents make Kent County thrive. Our relationship um, is solid, um, both from a staff standpoint at the county level, as well as the Board of Commissioners. And um, they understand what we do and the benefits that we can do for the community, and vice versa, we couldn't do what we do without the help of Kent County. While most of us are busy running our lives, Kent County's elected officials, administrator controller, and over 1,600 employees are serving the communities where we live our lives so we can all have a place we are proud to call home. Kent County, it's life well run. Good morning everybody and welcome to the Kent County Board of Commissioners meeting. Today's date is Thursday, November 9th, 2017. The time is 8.30 a.m. We'll begin today's meeting with roll call. Thank you. Good morning. Commissioners Womack. Here. Voorhees. Present. Vonk. Here. Talon. Here. Steck. Here. Skaggs. Here. Ponstein. Here. Morgan. Here. Melton. Here. Mast. Here. Corndike. Present. Coleman. Here. Jones. Here. Hennessy. Here. Bolkowski. Present. Breevy. Here. Vice Chair Bolter. Here. Commissioner Antor. Here. Chair Saltfeld. Here. Mr. Chair, you have 19 members present, zero absent. You have a quorum. Thank you. I will then call on Commissioner Steck for invocation and Pledge of Allegiance. Good morning, all. Please join me in an invocation. Our dear Heavenly Father, our Lord and Creator, we praise you as a God of love and a God of mercy, and we acknowledge that you are also a God of reconciliation. And while we seem to be drawn to our differences and almost celebrate what drives us apart, you are instead interested in what brings us together. And in you there is no rich or poor, black or white, liberal or conservative, and even 
Democrat or Republican. We pray that as you have been reconciled to us and we reconciled to you, we would also be reconciled to each other. So we pray that you would remove those threads of bias and prejudice that are in our lives and extinguish those flashes of bigotry that seem to invade our thinking. Lord, it has been a difficult and challenging time for our country. We've experienced hurricanes, floods, shocking attacks, and mass murders. We pray that in the face of these disasters, you would bring calm and peace, and that our response would be to show love and mercy and support and comfort, and that then you would help us to forge just but wise responses. As we approach another Veterans Day, we also especially pray for our servicemen, our women, that you would support them and care for them, be with their families as well. And finally, as we take up the calling to govern in this place, may we do so fairly and justly. We pray all of this in your name. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Special order. Thank you, Commissioner Steck. Uh, we'll move then to agenda item five, and we'll start with item A, which is the 2018 budget public hearing. And we're going to start with a presentation by Interim County Administrator Wayman Britt. We'll come to the podium. <coughs> Move to the podium. Good morning, and uh, it is my pleasure as interim county administrator, controller, to present the 2018 budget proposal to this board and to the citizens of Kent County. A formal presentation, which will highlight the general fund portion of the recommended budget after which we will be happy to answer any questions that you might have. The proposed budget was developed with these parameters as a guide. The county strives to provide high quality services to citizens in a cost effective manner. The proposed budget was developed with this in mind. The proposed budget is structurally balanced meaning the requested budget is supported by current resources. The county continues to be committed to the maintenance of its capital infrastructure. Our budget policy requires that a minimum of 0.2 mills be allocated to the CIP budget, while the proposed budget allocates the equivalent of 0.3 mills. And board priorities were used as a tool in the development of the board proposed budget. Where did the resources come from? As mentioned earlier, the 2018 general fund budget the recommendation is structurally balanced and is supported by 172.3 million in estimated resources. The majority of the county's resources come from property taxes. The taxes make up 92.8 million or 53.9% of total resources. The 2018 property tax estimate is based on an operating millage of 4.28 mills, which is unchanged since 2004 and it is an estimated taxable value of $22.5 billion. Now, neither of these two variables will be finalized until May of 2018. At that time, the Headley Amendment, the impact of the Headley Amendment on the operating millage will be known. After four consecutive years of declining taxable value, Taxable value has increased modestly since 2013. Mm -hmm. And in 2018, the taxable value estimate is estimated to increase 3.1% over 2017. 
while taxable value only increased 3.2 percent since 2009 for an annual average increase of just 0.04 percent, 0.04 percent. To put that in perspective, taxable value grew 66.8 percent from 1998 to 2007. That's an average annual increase well over 6 percent. This is an indicator that the county has not recovered from the recession due to economic conditions and the impacts of proposal A. <coughs> Tax revenue estimate for 2018 is $92.8 million. As seen in this graph, the 2018 tax revenue is estimated to finally surpass the tax revenue collected in 2009. This is nine years later. Meanwhile, the county population has grown 7.7% since 2009. Population growth equals increased demand for services and the county is currently providing services with over 130 less employees than it had in 2009 before staff reductions were made to maintain balanced budget. Now where do the resources go? <coughs> County resources are used to provide high quality services to its citizens in a cost effective manner. <coughs> These services are spread across seven functional areas, the largest of which are displayed in this graph. General government establishes and administers overall county goals and policies, provides legal advice and representation, conducts program audits and analysis, assesses and collects property taxes for all taxing entities, and provides various support services to the entire organization. 35 million or 20.3 percent of the total available resources are dedicated to this functional area and are used to provide these services to the entire organization. Five point nine million or three point four percent of the total available resources are dedicated to recreation and culture, which enhances the quality of life in Kent County by providing parks for citizens to gather for public and private events. Parks are used to host weddings, com company picnics, family reunions, nonprofit fundraisers, and a wide range of other special events that bring our community together. Public safety preserves and protects the safety and security of the county residents. It provides criminal and civil enforcement, maintains a communication center to facilitate emergency or call answering and provides a safe and secure correctional facility. Sixty-three million, or 36.6% of the total available resources are dedicated to public safety, the largest of all functions, the largest of all the functions. Social services promotes Self-reliance safeguards the well-being and fiscal and social well, social well-being of many county residents by influencing policies, provides education programs and services, and it responds to the needs of vulnerable populations. 7.4 million, or 4.3 percent of the total available resources, are dedicated to these social services provided to the citizens of the county. The judicial function administers justice fairly according to existing laws. It hears civil, criminal, appeals, probate, and traffic cases. It also handles decedent estates, guardianships, conservatorships, mental health, and trust matters. And it seeks justice for all victims of crime and children in need. Twenty-seven point 
3 million or 15.8% of the total available resources <coughs> dedicated to judicial services allocated to the co county courts and the prosecutor's office. Now the remainder of the resources are allocated to public works. Now this is the drain commission, uh, not Department of Public Works. Uh, economic development and transfers out. Over 30 million support is transferred out to these governmental agencies that you see here on the chart. Uh, and they provide core services to the citizens of Kent County and the entire organization. Looking forward, revenue sharing is an ongoing challenge and we will continue to have concerns that the state may once again look to reduce the level of, of support. The county property tax revenue in 2017 has only now returned to the level experienced in 2009 and it will continue to be behind actual growth in property values due to low inflation in prop Proposition A. Miller's rates are also being rolled back due to the Headley Amendment. And this may have an impact on the 2000 operating millage. 2018 operating millage. The county is currently in negotiations with four of its unions, with six more to follow next year. There are also demands to expand staffing levels in some county departments. <clears throat> now the county must continue to strategically manage its personnel costs. And the county will be required to have a long-term plan in place for investments in IT and infrastructure including 82 Aonia, Parks Administration, Fleet Garage, and potential park expansion. This, that's to name a few. The county has incurred the cost also of implementing a new circuit court judge that we just started last year. Scale has since recommended an additional district court judge. So stay tuned for that as, as we look forward to uh, future year. And there continues to be external demands for us uh, and our funding, uh, such as Whitewater, PDR, the West Michigan Sports Commission. Network 180, Behavior Health Crisis Center, and Calder Plaza, to name a few. The county must be judicious in its decision making when considering these competing demands as resources are limited. So the board is scheduled to act on the 2018 budget on Thursday, November the 30th at 8.30 a.m. here in this boardroom. And, and, and the address is 310, uh, the, the, the room is 310, and it's the county administration building for the public to know. And the proposed budget is available for review on access again. I want to thank the board uh, for all of your hard work and the due diligence that has been put into the review of this budget. I also want to thank the department directors for their hard work in developing the budget and the budget review teams for their time and due diligence and a great shout out to the fiscal services department for coordinating uh, this process. And I'll answer, we will answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Just to be clear, is this time for commissioner questions or, or is that at a later time that this is? Commissioner questions. Okay, all right. So uh, we'll open up any questions at this time. 
Commissioner Jones? I'll just add a comment that we had the budget looked at at the Finance and Physical Resources Committee meeting, and it did pass uh, with everyone voting yes at that meeting. Uh, we did not have any public comment at that meeting on the budget, and I wanted to commend, as Wayman did in his opening letter, all the different department staffs, our efforts that go into making this happen. This is an area that takes a lot of time and attention and focus, and we do that, and we do it well. And the comment that I made at the end of our Finance and Physical Resources Committee meeting is what a great county we live in. How fortunate are we that we're not one of those counties that makes the news because financially there's issues. We're not that. And for that, I'm very grateful and proud to be here. So good job, Wayman. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Mann. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Wayman, for a nice presentation. Uh, are you able to send that to us via email? Because I would like it, or, or and I should probably ask you, can I have, can I use some of those slides sure. in other venues that I have? I know sure. I've got a legislative Wyoming Chamber of Commerce, Wyoming County Chamber of Commerce meeting Monday morning. Sure. You know, what, what strikes me is, and, and I've talked about it, and, and every municipality that, that relies on property tax is having difficulty. All our major cities are. Uh, the state doesn't rely on property tax, so they're cruising along real nice. They keep getting bumps in the income tax, although that's kind of struggling too. But. So I just want to hold this up before our state legislators, which will be at the meeting, um, remember us, and then and then put in the pitch about revenue sharing, which always keeps, keeps going. So I would like to have a copy. Probably want to send it to everybody. I think this is helpful because it was it was it was kind of illuminating. I was looking through the budget book that we had. It doesn't have those lines on it in that type of type of uh, presentation. So thanks. Thank you. I, I do want to make a quick point of order. Um, we will actually vote on the budget at the next meeting on the 30th, and we'll have an opportunity to comment on the budget then too. So I didn't want people to think this is their only chance to make comments on the budget. So okay. Uh, any other uh, commissioners, Mr. Corndike? I just want to th say thank you to Wayman for the first time going through this budget. Uh, you did a great job, and uh, I would ask everyone to take a look at pages 12 and 13, which are basically the executive uh, summary from Wayman. It's very well written, and it, it lays out what our overall big picture goals are and how we're going to go about achieving those. So thank you very much, Wayman. Appreciate uh, all the work and also to the staff for everything you've put together in this budget. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Stack. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's almost deceptively straightforward and simple when you present it. Uh, and I know there's so much deliberation and, uh, and for the public's benefit, an awful lot of, um, of analysis that has gone on before we get to this point. So um, this is not a slam bam simple process. So thank you for that. And the other thing I want to acknowledge is, frankly, after, uh, after spending so many hours struggling with some budgets with some other agencies we know, um, it, it's so nice to see one that balances. Thank you. Anyone else uh, has a comment at this time? I see none, so uh, I just was going to point out one thing. You know, it's really, I think the real story of this budget is the fact that over the last 10 years, we've had population in the county up 10%. We've had values of the property up, I think you said 6% year over year. And yet, just this year, we're at the same point in terms of revenue received that we were in 2009. And that's due primarily to Proposal A and some other factors, but I just think that's a that's a really significant fact that when, when you talk to constituents, you need to make sure that they're aware of how that works. Because I think a lot of people think, well, gee, you know, we wouldn't have benefited over the years with that increase that we had in, in property values, but that's only now reaching the level that it was in 2009. Okay, uh, with that, thank you, Wayman. Uh, we're, we're at a point now where I will declare a, a public hearing open. Uh, and this is where uh, anybody from the public can come forward if they have a comment on the 2018 proposed budget. I'm going once, going twice, very good. Then I will call on Vice Chair Bolter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A motion to close the public hearing. On the budget. Support. And there is support. Uh, any questions or comments on that? 
If not, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Uh, again, we will vote on the budget at the next meeting on the 30th. Uh, we now move to agenda item 5B, which is a uh, special order of business presentation from Experience Grand Rapids, and invite Doug Small forward. Good morning, Doug. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, Chairman Solfeld, thanks for the opportunity once again to come in front of you to, to uh, talk about your investment uh, or the county's investment um, in tourism. And I think what you're going to see is that your investment is not only being used wisely, but uh, is um, creating some great results. Um, and I hope you see that when you talk uh, about the lodging excise tax at your meetings, that it has continued to grow handsomely um, over the last couple of years. Um, on the screen, it's just our mission. Um, mission statements sometimes have some fancy words, so I'll just simplify it. Fill, drive visitors and fill hotel rooms. And if we do those things, then a lot of buckets in this county are going to get filled. Um, every decision we make in our organization is result is, uh, um, uh, for a business development plan. Any money that's going to be put out to attract business must someday lead to a hotel room night. And that's how we operate. Uh, before I get into numbers, I do want to talk a little bit about staff. Um, we are as you see here, 30 full-time staff members working at Experience Grand Rapids, and that includes an, an office in Washington, D.C. Uh, Washington, D.C. is the home to probably 80-some percent of the national associations, and uh, we are one of about 70 convention and visitors bureaus that have offices in Washington, D.C. So we have a salesperson on the ground there in front of these associations on a daily basis, drumming up national convention business for us. Um, we're, we use a lot of interns. Uh, we've got great colleges and universities in the area. We take advantage of that talent. It hopes also that they continue on in our industry. Um, our organization is pretty simple, as you see here. Convention sales, marketing, multicultural business development, and then um, the administration staff. I will tell you about 52% of the budget goes into marketing programs. 41% of the budget goes into convention sales and service solicitation and 7% is used for administration. So the majority of the funding is used for, uh, to again, achieve the mission that I showed you. Um, I brought along the, um, our executive team, our leadership team today, with the exception of Mr. Bennett, who is out on the road with one of our sales managers, uh, trying to uh, tackle some new convention business uh, in Chicago. Uh, but with me today, and you're gonna hear from Janet Corner, Senior Vice President. Uh, Kim Young is here. Uh, Dan is here, um, and then Angela Nelson, the newest member of our leadership team, who you're also going to hear from today. Uh, our strategic plan, and we're in uh, the uh, coming up on the last year of our three-year strategic plan, um, and uh, proud to say that as you look at these five main objectives or goals in our strategic plan, that uh, we've accomplished pretty much everything thus far that we've um, hoped to do. Um, one of the major ones is the first one, and uh, we worked with Grand Action to uh, put together a destination asset study uh, that uh, basically I went to my board and said, we've gotten to a certain level, we've grown dramatically as it relates to hotel occupancy, room rates, but how do we get to that next level? Do we have the current infrastructure, do we have the current branding um, uh, tools to get to the next level? Um, and uh, so we decided to try to find that answer. So that's what the study was commissioned for. The wheel here shows the seven major outcomes of that study. Um, proud to say that there has been a working committee, um, great collaboration in the community of champions in all these different areas. So this is just not Experience Grand Rapids, it's DGRI, it's, it's, uh, it's chamber folks. Um, a lot of collaboration to make certain that this plan gets worked. Um, one of the major things that came out of this was uh, more of an immediate need for new convention style hotels or at least a three to 500 room convention style hotel downtown in order to just help us build business with the current uh, convention center structure. Um, intermediate goal was to look at the potential of an expansion of the convention center. Um, I believe the uh, CAA is commissioning a study that should be going out in the next couple of weeks to look at the hotel uh, product um, and get a little bit more uh, background and, and detail before um, us coming up with a plan to develop a new convention hotel downtown. We've had over 
about 10 to 12 percent new rooms added to our inventory in the last year. As you'll see in the numbers, we've been able to absorb that new inventory to date. Here's occupancy, as I mentioned it. Um, showing here from 2011 through the current. Um, I could go back a couple more years and tell you that in 2008, we ran 48% as a county in hotel occupancy. I remember that. And I do too. That was when I was hired, Roger, and somebody said, what, what are you thinking? And I said, there's only one way to go. <laughs> um, in, uh, but it's risen dramatically um, to the point where we're almost at 70%. Um, you're going to see another slide here. that'll show you the national average, which is a couple points below where we currently are. Um, as a destination. So hotels are doing very, very well, thus the development that you're seeing. Developers seek out locations that are showing consistent growth like this, um, and uh, we will continue to see more of that. With that, and probably more importantly, is does that produce hotel revenue? Occupancy is not everything. I could fill hotels at low rates all day, but can you fill hotels and while at the same time protect the rate um, uh, that you have and or more importantly grow the rate? and that thus would give us more revenue. Um, again, proud to say when you look at our competitive set, which is Pittsburgh and Milwaukee and Cincinnati and so on, we lead our competitive set both occupancy and rate. Yeah. And some of you that stay in hotels are going, well, don't raise the rates small. I mean, we want the rates to stay <laughs> low. Um, we were so undervalued as a destination for so many years, we're now just getting to the point of where we should be. Um, so we're very, we, we continue to be very competitive when chasing both convention and leisure business. Uh, important to you, the Kent County Lodging Excise Tax. Um, again, this is in um, millions, but uh, we're, uh, we're, we're approaching that eight million mark. And uh, uh, it's, it's been um, great to watch this grow. I know that former Administrator DeLavio would continue to remind me every time I saw him that this is fine, but can you give me about 10 to 15 more years of this kind of growth? So we do have our marching on that. I see William is smiling, so I know that he will continue telling me that uh, going forward, but we're up to that challenge. With that, we have more, more money to market um, as we go out um, nationally. Um, and we had a meeting yesterday to talk about even internationally to continue to spread the brand of Kent County and Grand Rapids to the world. Um, back in 2010, we had a budget of 4.39, as you can see, and we're, we are presenting a 2018 budget of nearly $11 million. And that money, keep in mind that um, the ma vast majority of our funding, um, probably between county and assessments, 90 plus percent of our funding comes as a result of filling hotel rooms. Um, so this is not membership. Uh, this is the only way our budget grows is fill more hotel rooms. And going back to the occupancy slide, it takes 26,000 more occupied rooms a year to move one point. So it's growing dramatically, thus again the development that you see. Uh, we work very close with Mike and his team. Um, and I know that uh, Roger and I spoke back when the, the first five years of the Sports Commission's funding um, um, was completed, and we chatted along with um, Daryl DeLabio about what do we do moving forward, and it was decided that we would move to a percentage-based investment from um, Kent County. So the better we do, the more we get, um, and uh, they asked for me to be committed to the Sports Commission and make it certain that Mike shared in that um, in that funding too, and we've kept up with that commitment. Um, and as you can see, 2018, we're estimating um, an investment uh, through hotel assessment and county lodging excise tax of about $880,000. And Mike, as you'll see here, has continued to, to have great results as an organization, and uh, we value the relationship. Convention sales is one part of what we do. I think a lot of people think that's all we do. Um, we spend probably more money trying to attract the leisure visitors. Somebody coming in, Jan will talk to that a little bit. Um, but because there's an investment in the convention center, it's important for us to show you uh, what goes on. It wasn't just a few years ago, we were booking about 120,000 future um, hotel rooms for conventions. Um, we last year ended the year at 151,000 room nights. So these are room nights that are gonna be spread out over the next several years. Um, and our goal this year is to try to get to 152,000 um, again uh, uh, this year. So 
Uh, that part of the market has also grown, as has Mike's, and, and he'll talk to that. So combined, it's uh, really, really a good story. <coughs> um, I appreciate all the assistance we've gotten from several of you, um, not only in this room, but your staff um, here at Kent County. These are just a few of the events that are either brought here by a staff member that's helped us bring this convention here, or somebody that's created an event like Commissioner Antor and his Freedom Cruise that help us fill hotel rooms. Um, in fact, I just received uh, Commissioner Talon's newsletter a couple weeks ago and noticed that he was heading to a conference and right away sent him a note and said, bring it here. And he, he's, he's helping us with that. So we'll see if we can close on that one, Jim. No pressure, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but we, we truly appreciate the, the work done by uh, Commissioner Bukowski. We've worked on a couple groups with you, and uh, it, it's 60 to 70 percent of our convention business comes as a result of somebody local stepping up to help us bring that convention here. So it's important. Um, before I turn it over to Angela, this is Smith Travel Re Research or a Star Report. Um, these folks are out of Nashville, Tennessee. We get weekly reports from them. Almost every hotel, in fact, the flagged hotels, the branded hotels, are required to send their numbers to Smith Travel Research, we compile the numbers, and then we can buy reports back. What this report is showing you is year to date through September, um, and showing you a comparison against our, what we chose as our competitive set. These are who we compete with for convention business. As you see, we fight well above our weight class. Uh, the far left hand column is your occupancy. And as I mentioned, 69.4%. Wow. The United States is at 674 so we're two points ahead of the United States average, uh, quite handsomely ahead of the Michigan average. Average rate uh, continues to lead the pack at $117. Um, and, um, and again, this is countywide. Uh, but the numbers, as I said, have just been terrific and uh, out outpacing our, our competitors. So before I turn it to Angela, any questions? Me or the numbers? <coughs> Any questions? Commissioner yeah, Matt. Well, thank you, Chair. Um, you know, that, that percentage occupancy is going up, but the number of rooms available is going up dramatically, so that occupancy is under, under you know, more hotels. It seems like you turn around every, every corner has we've, got a new motel going up. Yeah, so. we've, and, uh, and we've been able to uh, look at the far right of that report, you'll see that we've been able to absorb that. It shows rooms available, rooms sold. We've been able to absorb that and then some. Yeah, right. um, yeah. So we've we've probably got another <laughs> eight hotels coming on board. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I know of four that already are in the ground and um, four more that I'm confident that at least two of them will be in the ground at some point, either late next year, early 19. So. That's the pressure on us to continue to, keep to find filled. new business. To keep them at the seventy percent. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yep. Sure Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Doug. Good morning. Congratulations. Uh, these you. are great numbers. Thank and you. Thanks for all your help with with the various events that come in for some little things that are needed along the way that you guys just do seamlessly. I'm wondering, we're coming up into um, trade show season here over right. the winter. And I'm wondering how we're set as far as being able to handle all the different requests. I know there's only a few facilities around town that can handle certain types of events. And I'm wondering if there's any plan to maybe expand that so we don't have to turn anybody away from trade shows. Yeah, the, uh, the winter season, um, the convention center, is, you wouldn't think an upper Midwest city would, would, would have this kind of um, business in the winter season. But from January through March, the center's pretty well full all the time. And it's, it's, it's the public shows we have, um, combined with the state associations, have their conventions during the winter. Michiganders have figured it out. They're smart people. They're not going to meet this summer. It's the best time to be out and about, right? So they, <laughs> they meet from January through April. Um, so our, our winter season is incredibly busy. The study identified, again, as an intermediate need that we're probably, in order to keep occupied 70%, build new business opportunity, we're probably going to need to expand meeting space. There's a couple ways you could do that. You could go right away and expand the convention center, or you could look at a expo style hotel that comes in that has a good amount of meeting space so that you can host a group in that and still host a citywide convention at the convention center. So now you've got two major groups in town, um, and uh, I sort of like that. And, um, but you are correct, you've got Delta Plex, you've got the convention center. Um, and then from there, smaller facilities to host those kind of things. So we can only go so big, um, and, and, and 
until recently, we've been able to, um, the type of business we've been able to attract, it's fit, but if we're going to take it to the next level, we're going to have to look at some expansion. Thank you. Mr. Morgan. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Morning. Morning. Um, a couple of things. Um, I should know this. I can't recall it. Uh, your contract runs through what date? Your existing contract now. It was a five-year. It was five-year agreement. Twenty twenty. Twenty twenty. So we'll be, I looked at the money, man. Yeah, okay, we'll be talking <laughs> again in twenty twenty. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to. You'll get to this, but you do a lot at the airport uh, with your ambassador program. We appreciate that, and I know you're going to mention that uh, you did land the ACI conference. Uh, we're very proud of that. That's so a big. High it's the airport. Conference the airport, kind of yeah. I don't want to get ahead of you, but no, I, I didn't. I didn't have that down. So you I, didn't. I know you're going to get your red pen out. I'm going to I can't points that. off. But, um, just, the uh, the airport councils international is the largest gathering of airport executives in the world, and uh, they bring obviously all the airlines come in. Um, but it is a it's something else. In fact, when we were awarded that, Thank I had a friend who runs the Oakland Airport sent me a text and said, do you know what you just did? He said, it's an airport generally your size and a community your size doesn't land this group. Um, and so it's, a, it's gonna be a privilege, um, a lot of work. I believe it's 2020. It is. 2020. And, um, but Jim Gill, when he was in Pittsburgh, who runs our airport, when he was in Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh hosted it. So he was familiar with it and helped us with the bid on that. So, yeah, it's a great, thanks for bringing well, that. We're really happy to get the news because it was something that we didn't know if we were in the game or not. And then you ended up landing it, and I just appreciate that. Yeah. All your hard work. It's exciting for us. Of your work. organization to get that, to get that, that whole project landed. And I got to tell you, it's a big deal. It's 7,000. I like to overstate a lot of things, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> this is a no. big deal. <laughs> so. Uh, Commissioner Jones. Thank you, Chair. First, I am honored to be the board rep on the board for Experience Grand Rapids. And I just wanted to take a moment to comment what a great run organization. And the board is pretty sizable. And I think for those commissioners who might be new, can you take just a minute and talk about you know, the depth of that board? Yeah, it's a lot of oversight. You know, we're a very transparent organization. Uh, we have 33 board members. Uh, 25 of those are voting board members. Um, by state legislation, uh, 13 of those must be either hotel owners or uh, operators. And uh, the remaining 12 voting members are a, a mix of the business community. Commissioner Jones, Mr. Britt serve on that. The mayor serves on it. There's a lot of oversight. Like a lot of boards, we have very active working committees. So our budget goes through a lot of eyes at the level of the finance committee and then goes on to the executive committee before it goes to the full board for approval. So um, we're very, very proud of our transparency, um, our stewardship of uh, the monies bestowed to us. And uh, thanks for bringing it up. I got a very, very fortunate, have a great active board of directors. Great, uh, but a great job of advising our organization. So Keep thanks, up the great work, Doug. Thank you. Commissioner Stack. Thank you, Chair. So I'm going to be accused of having it out for Airbnb here pretty soon. But, um, <laughs> one of the things that, that I <laughs> one of the things that I heard yesterday at the right place. Um, I don't know if you were there, but the um, one of the fastest growing companies in the country is Airbnb, and it's it's just exploding, uh, as was reported. So, do we track that? Are you aware of that? What's your strategy, Mike? Are you about up? <laughs> <laughs> we we track it in the sense of. We continue to read, keep ourselves educated as to um, everything about Airbnb. We also call it old fashioned, but we do just subjectively chat with our hotels, especially our smaller hotels, to say, are you feeling it? the effects of Airbnb? In this community, we're not feeling it much. I think when you get on the shoreline up north, um, they feel it a little bit more. And um, obviously, large cities. Um, we've never, as an organization, got together and said we're going to stand in the way of an Airbnb. We would like to see uh, continued um, ordinances and other things that make sure that they operate safely. Um, but 
it is what it is. Who it hurts the most are those bed and breakfasts that have been in business for years, are paying us money to market them. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the ones I think are being hurt even in this community, are the bed and breakfasts. Okay, I know you have uh, a couple more, uh, some more uh, presentations. So um, we'll I'll turn it over to Angela. Okay. Good morning, Angela. Good morning, everyone, and thank you um, for having us. I am um, pleased to be um, a part of the new leadership or part of the leadership at Experience Grand Rapids. I am in my eighth month now, um, serving in the role of VP of Multicultural Business <coughs> Development. And I will be brief in my remarks and certainly invite anyone to um, join me for lunch um, if you'd like to learn a little bit more deeper about our strategy with regard to um, our multicultural business development plan. Um, my area really focuses on three strategic priorities. Um, it's embracing diversity for the benefit of visitor economy, enhancing community awareness and engagement, and then establishing a hospitality and tourism management workforce development plan. Um, the business case was made or has been made uh, with many organizations that diversity is good for business and our organization um, was, is committed to that. Um, our board as well as our diversity advisory committee um, determined that there was a need to continue to um, market in diverse um, uh, tourism travel segments and that investment was made. It was made in hiring me, it was made in um, providing me with the budget to do the things that I just shared with you and so I can um, confidently tell you that we are committed to promoting inclusive, inclusivity and um, Grand Rapids as an inclusive and belonging community and we do that in partnership with you all. Your investment in Experience Grand Rapids means an investment in me and an investment in these priorities along with other community partners. Um, I do have a couple of slides and uh, as you can see here our strategy with embracing um, diversity for the benefit of visitor economy is really making sure that internally and externally we're thinking and looking through um, a diversity lens um, as we engage our marketing and sales initiatives um, and just creating an environment of trust and um, innovation as we uh, continue to be inclusively or have that mindset of inclusivity. Um, we also are committed to um, increasing the diversity, um, the work, I'm sorry, we are, include, we are committed to increasing and diversifying our hospitality and tourism management talent pool. Um, we're really excited about some partnerships that are on the horizon with um, our local university, Grand Valley State University, as well as um, our public schools, GRPS, to implement a program that will um, help our students bring awareness and um, interest in the hospitality and tourism industry at an early age and really fill that pipeline. So as we continue to build and develop hotels, we'll have the workforce um, to fill those jobs. So there's a demand, um, there's an increase in our supply and there would definitely be a demand for more employees. And uh, here, enhancing community engagement and awareness is really about just making sure that we continue to educate our stakeholders and our community um, about who we are, what we do, uh, what we don't do as well, and um, bringing them along to help us, again, bring, F, uh, bring our conventions um, to Grand Rapids. And so there's great opportunity for us to increase um, our engagement in those multicultural segments, which would include um, you know, um, LGBTQ, diversity, um, disabilities, um, more business in the Hispanic and the African American market. And so we are definitely um, working hard to bring those um, industries or conferences to Grand Rapids. And I'm excited to partner with our seasoned staff um, in marketing and sales to um, increase our exposure to Grand Rapids, which is a wonderful <coughs> place to not only um, live but work and play and visit for conferences so thank you all again for your time that really concludes my section and I'm going to turn it over to Janet. Thank you Angela and good morning Janet. Good morning. 
All right, well, I'm going to um, quickly move through these slides, and then uh, we could all take questions if you have more. I have some pretty pictures to show you, but I really want to just express the fact that our website, experiencegr.com, is really the core strength of our marketing efforts. And we have the team deployed in a content, with a content marketing strategy, and it seems to be working. So our external investments in marketing and advertising all point back to experiencegr.com. And I can tell you that in the month of August, we hit an all-time record high of 200, over 250,000 users looking at our website for information. And I think it's also interesting to note that 62% of that traffic is now coming from smartphones or mobile devices. Partly um, because of the smartphone and mobile devices, but also because of the interests um, within the community, we also made some uh, enhancements to the website. Websites are never completed. They're always a work in progress. Um, the destination asset study that Doug mentioned identified outdoor recreation as a key asset that we could do more with. And so the team worked this year to um, pull together uh, better content related to trails. We launched a new app that allows um, bike enthusiasts to find their way. There's a couple of uh, trails and each year we'll be launching a two additional trails, uh, kind of like journeys around the destination. And um, we also launched a new um, grand investment um, blog series that's published on our website. And that really tells the business case, the sort of kind of add an additional dimension to the business story. Like why are all these cranes here? Why are all these people moving to this place? And then I also want to note that um, we've expanded our accessibility information on our website. And now you can search by that. And uh, we're, we're just at the beginning, I think, of collecting all the content that we would need to adequately do that. But we've collected a lot of transportation data. And um, I'm proud of that effort. Um, I think sometimes what's old is new again. Um, in 2017, we relaunched a new size and a new look to our visitor guide. And um, we, for multiple years, have distributed a, a, the 100,000 that we've made. It's so popular that I don't have one. Well, I mean, we have a few, but I have to. I, I don't have one to show you today. But um, next year, we're actually going to increase our print. And this is, I think, indicative of the fact that we do use these at our area hotels. So we have more hotel rooms. And we have more guests coming in. And um, it's also a trend that our peers around the country are seeing as well. So interestingly enough, Millennials like magazines. <laughs> and we haven't mentioned craft beer, so um, I, I thought I would just bring up um, a program that we launched two years ago that's phenomenally successful, and that is our Beer Passport program. And in two years, we have over 8,000 Crusaders, and they're really all over the country. Um, you can see that the blue section on the wheel is the local Crusaders. But the remainder of the wheel are either somewhere outside of Kent County and the gray area is outside of the state. And we actually have 152 Crusaders around the world. And uh, this is just a slide that um, highlights some of the other things to do. And I think the um, important thing to note here, um, well, there's many important things, but um, the Art Prize Shuttle continued to be a successful way for us to bring our suburban hotel guests into the downtown Art Prize and really just provide a better customer experience for people coming to our area that aren't familiar with where to park and how to drive around. And then food remains a really key component of any trip anywhere. And so our work to um, bring our craft beverage industry together with our food and then the celebration of Restaurant Week and um, our ability to give back to the, um, the, the educational program at um, the community college, um, I think is also, I'm really proud of that effort as well. And that will take questions. Okay, any other questions? Commissioner Melton? I have just one for um, Angela, uh, representing Kentwood. Um, of course, Kentwood is known primarily because of its diversity uh, and its High school is, is just a melting pot of what 70 different languages and countries. Um, a lot of what, what they have done is reach out to the medical corridor there on Michigan. I'm guessing you have done the same. 
and I know you're experienced Grand Rapids, but when you talked about going into Grand Rapids Public Schools and partnering, partnering with them, I don't know if it's ever dawned on you to go into the Kentwood Schools too, again, just because our diversity is so strong there. Uh, I think you would really be amazed at the number of uh, countries, persons, personalities, languages that you would be coming across. Absolutely, and thank you for bringing that um, to our attention. So um, Kentwood is definitely not lost on us. Um, we are at the very beginning stages of um, discovering what uh, this workforce development program will look like, and Kentwood is definitely on our list of um, school districts to partner with um, down the road. And so we definitely want to make sure that whatever this program is that is done right out of the gate and so um, being that Kentwood is a very diverse community is certainly I would say at the top it's it's on our it's on our radar and we will certainly um, foster those relationships um, I was a Kentwood resident for a few years um, before moving back downtown but certainly um, to answer your question, yes, we will partner with them. Um, and when we do, we want to make sure that when we go into that district, that even though it's a diverse um, school, that the program delivery is done effectively and, and well. Okay. So thank, thank you. Commissioner Mass. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, you know, the, the, the marketing slogan for the state of Michigan, Pure Michigan, is sort of under attack. Could you just comment about that? How, how is your marketing? Does, does it relate to that? Do you do you experience some of the positives from your I, I don't think the brand is under attack as much as the funding of well, the organization. Um, and um, it's it's not new news. It's been for years. It, it, what, what really stirred it up was um, they used a, a firm for a lot of years that would look at um, do a study on their ROI of the program. We've also used that firm. In fact, this is my fifth destination. I've used them in every destination to the world's best. Um, they were attacked uh, by a group saying that the numbers are basically stating exactly what Travel Michigan wants them to say. Um, and so they did their own study, um, albeit that they looked at three areas, not nine areas of tourism, and came back and said that the ROI that the state was reporting was not true. Um, so the answer is yes, there continues to be people that look. It's okay for people. I think you should have people that look out for the dollars being spent. Um, but uh, I know we, we, will, we will tell you that our leisure business, when you look at those numbers, our leisure business has gone off the charge. The leisure business is just people coming for weekends and such. A big part of that is our collaboration with Pure Michigan on our national television ads that we do and others. Uh, without that, we would not have seen this growth. And, and that's not measurable, necessarily. Uh, it is. We, it is. we measure it. We can, we, we can tell how many incremental visits we've received um, As a since result advertising, of just through our advertising. No. Yeah, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we got time for, did you have questions? Uh, four more questions, and then we're going to uh, move on. Uh, Commissioner Ponstein. Thank you, Chair Self. I'll, I'll just to tie, tie on to that. I heard the governor speak uh, a couple days ago now. Pure Michigan was mentioned in his comments several times. I think he knows the value of promoting the state of Michigan, not just for business, but for tourism. But my question is for Janet, uh, and, and you can get the information to me later. Uh, in your one of your slides, you said that we hosted 78 journalists and bloggers. Can you dwell on, I mean, how do we go about finding them? How do we ensure that uh, it's going to be a positive? Are there certain sectors that we target? Because I'm, you know, I'm sure there's hundreds of them that do this. I mean, how does that all work? Uh, well, there's there is that's a lot of questions. Well, um, well, we collaborate with well, too. yeah, we collaborate with partners. So some of those journalists come as a part of our collaboration with Pure Michigan and the state's efforts to also attract journalists. Um, some of them are international journalists coming um, because the state has outreach efforts into um, the UK, Germany, and China. So we host journalists through those. And then our own efforts are, are usually aligned with our brand pillars. So what that means is around art and culture, 
around um, food, craft beverages. And so we vet, the, we vet them. So the amount of hosting varies depending on the, um, the audience size and the, the reach. Um, we do actually publish all links to um, most of those articles that we can that are um, that are written on behalf of us um, because of those visits to the destination. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Town. Thank you, Chair. I was hoping I could ask two questions. First one's real short. I think um, are are you fairly integrally involved with the uh, bike share study that's being done for downtown? Um, comment on that? Yes, we are. So we per we're participating in the, um, the meetings and the discussion around it because um, it, it's, it's one of the topics that we, ch we are, as a visitor service, um, very challenged by, is that we can promote the destination for biking, but you have to bring your own. So that's kind of a, a lead to my second question, which is, if you'd be willing to share, how are we doing um, in enabling visitors to get around downtown? Do we have a long way to go yet? Are we getting there? Any thoughts about that? Um, I don't know if we have a long way to go. We certainly have <laughs> ways to go yet. Uh, the, the dash system, the changes in the dash system have helped some. It needs to, there needs to be more changes in that. And we are, much like your question about the bike study, we're actively involved with giving feedback uh, to the folks and looking at that, and, they, and they're approaching us too. Um, because the dash was not meant for visitors when it was first created, and it, it needs to be, especially with what's going on, on the west side, all the great opportunities. We've got to be able to start moving people around and make it easier for people to move around. Um, so I think the combination of the bike share, and if we get to where we need to get with the dash system, um, and continue to tout it as a great walking city. Um, but uh, the other thing too is also getting them out in the neighborhoods and neighboring communities, um, whether it's Kentwood or Rockford or what have you. Um, generally, those people either rent a car, or, but you can also do the white, you can do the trail too to get out to those areas. So it, it'll never stop, I don't think, Commissioner. I think we got to continue to get better in, in our <coughs> transportation needs, at least from a visitor's perspective. Thank you. Commissioner Antro. Thank you, Chair. J just a comment. Um, <clears throat> my other life, I've been promoting trade shows for 26 years you know, they're around the state but our signature events always been here in Grand Rapids and every year we, we get a chance to interview our vendors <clears throat> that come in they're traveling from all over the world literally and all over the country Canada um, and the one thing that we're always just amazed by not amazed but they absolutely love Grand Rapids Kent County this area we're really unique, and, and you, I think a couple years ago, three or four years ago, you went to, uh, your slogan was the giant little town, and I can't tell you how effective that, that's, that's our strength. Uh, the fact is we're not Chicago or Detroit or San Francisco, and people like that because there's so many <coughs> barriers um, that are associated with that. People come in here, enjoy themselves. The cost is relatively low still to come here, and I'm just amazed at how much they love this town and the quality of the people, that's what we hear more than anything, the quality of people that come to the show. It's it's unbelievable. I'd like to share with you the video because you wouldn't think there'd be that big a difference from region to region, but they're talking about the quality of the people, which is something we should all be proud of. So anyhow, just to comment, I, I hope we can maintain that giant little town, even though we're growing. Mm -hmm. We do so in a way where we don't overreach and we try to maintain that. We're cozy yet impressive. Yes, very much so. <laughs> <laughs> Fisher, old man. Got to process that. Yes, I, I just like to um, thank Doug Smith, your organization, all the staff members for your hard work. It's just very exciting to look at the percentages, the numbers, and indicators that are on the rise for the city of Grand Rapids. But one thing that's very amazing about your work that I'm very proud of is that the numbers aren't in contrast to what we're seeing here in the community. People feel the new energy that's here in Grand Rapids. They recognize a spike in the visitors that are coming here. Me being also with a radio station, we book a lot of national acts here. And uh, over the last five years, we know we have to book in advance if we want those hotel rooms. It wasn't always like that. You could book a week in advance, a couple days. Now we're, we're very much trying to be 60 days, 30 days out. Um, 
to accommodate those artists, and that is a result of some of your great work. So just keep up the good work. And finally, Commissioner Borges. Thank you, Chair Salfeld. Good morning. Uh, Doug, my question is, this uh, year we'll again set new records at John Ball Zoo. Uh, we'll be over a half a million visitors to the zoo. And we know that is larger than just our uh, residents, Kent County residents. We are drawing from the nation. And uh, as we continue to expand and enhance uh, John Ball Zoo, uh, are, are we in, in the experience Grand Rapids involving and bringing in that uh, place as a, a, a place of destination that people will come? And it's getting to uh, a, a great size where uh, people will come back or they'll come and stay for a couple of days to, uh, uh, to experience it all. So. It, it's certainly one of our primary Thank uh, attractions. And, uh, Peter there, and we're, we're, we, we participate in a group that meets on a regular basis with all the cultural um, attractions, um, and the zoo being part of that group, just to talk about collaborative efforts and keep everything on everybody's radar. So, uh, oh yeah, it's a it's a big part of the experience, and, and the great thing is too, it's it's from the convention district, it's 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 a, a very easy to get to um, as opposed to some zoos in other cities. So, it's a great attraction. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Doug, uh, Janet, Angela, thank you for that presentation. As always, very good, very great results to always hear that. And uh, we thank you for your time. I always know that we have lots of questions, and if our commissioners have more, I'm sure you're available to answer those as well. Um, we move to agenda item 5C and invite Mike Gusweiler forward, and he will give us uh, a report on the West Michigan Sports Commission. Thank you, Chair Saltfeld, Commissioners. It's always a pleasure to be here. I think uh, this meeting will quickly be known as the Destination Marketing Meeting. <laughs> but it is timely that, uh, that we give this presentation both today, but also as we've combined this day regularly now with Experience Grand Rapids because they're a very similar theme. Uh, we work closely together, and they're an important ally of ours, certainly, uh, as we work to promote sports tourism in the area. Um, and additionally, as we look at uh, you know, your budget proposal and the West Michigan Sports Commission, of course, being called out, uh, and we look at the timeliness of 10 years, uh, that 10 years ago, uh, the Kent County Board of Commissioners uh, voted and decided to create the West Michigan Sports Commission, uh, and you've continued your investment uh, throughout those 10 years. So uh, in terms of that and in looking at those uh, those key aspects, uh, I hope through this presentation that you find your investment uh, was certainly worthwhile and I uh, certainly see what we see uh, as staff members and, and the Sports Commission uh, that we've only uh, hit the, the surface of what we can do. Much like Doug pointed out with regard to our mission, uh, we're an economic development organization. We do it through sports tourism. Uh, we rely on the great marketing efforts of our partner and Experience Grand Rapids and what they do to really bring accolades in national publications about how great this destination is. And then we target uh, specifically for bringing sports tournaments in. Uh, we've done strategic planning as well and we look at how to utilize the best resources that we can, uh, the best of our resources. And uh, through this last planning session, uh, looking at these past three years, some of these key directives that have come out of that. And that continues to be grow our sports tourism through multifaceted efforts. And I'll talk more about those efforts through my presentation. But also building awareness locally, regionally, and nationally through social media, uh, through digital marketing, our public relations strategies that tie into, of course, uh, sports tourism and, and these multifaceted efforts. Maintaining and growing our strategic partnerships, uh, certainly with Kent County, again, uh, referencing the importance of our relationship with Experience Grand Rapids uh, and working with national sports governing bodies as we promote this destination as they experience it for the first time, uh, the, the impact is tremendous. And then leading the discussion of new sport infrastructure and I'll talk a little bit more on, uh, on the component of enhancing youth and amateur sports that's come out of the destination asset study. Uh, also our efforts that we've done with the Art Band Sports Complex uh, and then water sports as we look at uh, the efforts to restore the rapids and really highlight the natural resource that we have running through our destination. 
Our structure, you've seen this slide before, it's grown from really our core of just working to promote our destination, bidding on events and bringing events in, uh, to putting on our own signature event. And that's been uh, tremendous and had tremendous growth in this past year uh, was significant. And I'll talk more about that. Uh, but the investment in the capital campaign uh, of building the Art Band Sports Complex and its three year op years of operation. Our staff has grown as well as we looked at the growth of our operation, the growth of the number of events that we're managing our uh, event calendar. Uh, many of our staff members are here behind me. We could uh, keep the sports theme and they could do the wave in their seat. <laughs> um, but we, we have a strong staff and, and a dedicated staff. And, and we also continue to receive accolades of the staff members and their efforts, uh, the work that they do, uh, awards uh, that, that we've received from our many events, uh, and I very much appreciate all of their efforts. Again, we have a strong board of directors as well. Uh, it's well represented throughout the community, uh, but also <coughs> by the county board of commissioners. Uh, Commissioner Jones, uh, you know, wears many hats, it sounds like, of course, with experience Grand Rapids representation, but uh, also Commissioner Voorhees. And we'll continue that representation, that connection to the county based on uh, your extensive investment in, in creating us, but also the continued investment. Our resources have grown uh, from, again, when we uh, originated and uh, received the investment from the county and uh, our partnership with experience Grand Rapids. Uh, the bulk of that, of course, continues to come from the lodging tax uh, through our partnership with Experience Grand Rapids and through the continued support of Kent County. Uh, and then a quarter, uh, approximately, of our two operating entities uh, also generate those portion of resources through the Meyer State Games in Michigan and also the Art Man Sports Complex. Uh, and I'll talk again a little bit more about the impact that it's had. To date, when we look at the course of 10 years and what it's produced, 630 sporting events, over a million different participants and their family members that have come into our community, and multiplying out how much each family spends typically on a two, three day weekend uh, is $290 million of direct spending that's come into our community over these 10 years. But of course, another important measurement uh, that, that plays back to the lodging tax, uh, certainly plays into the efforts of our partners in Experience Grand Rapids is, uh, are we filling hotel rooms? Uh, you know, the growth continues. This just shows the last five years uh, with projected ending at, at over 43,000 hotel room nights. And again, we think, and I, I know that my partner, uh, Doug Small with Experience Grand Rapids has shown in his reports, that sports, the sports market continues to be a growing market uh, and there's a lot of opportunity there yet to be had. This just identifies some of our uh, sample of major sporting events that we've had, of course, this year, but heading into 2018 and 2019, the State Games of America, and again, I'll touch on the impact of that. Uh, men's Fast Pitch World Championships at the Art Man Sports Complex. Uh, NCAA D3 working with Calvin College is returning, uh, coming up uh, actually in just uh, about a week, I think. Uh, and so we'll make sure you look uh, at our calendar for that if you enjoy uh, collegiate volleyball. Um, but you know, we're very pleased with the partnership we have with our collegiate institutions as well as our uh, many high schools and, and parks and facilities. In 2018, uh, major events continue uh, as we look at MHSA and some of their finals. We had the opportunity to gain another final in the girls' basketball finals, working with Calvin College again. Uh, we've got USA Weightlifting, which is a great story. That's a new uh, sports governing body that uh, tested the waters of Grand Rapids uh, through incredible comments to our service and sales staff, and the, their efforts and their experience moving around throughout the country to different destinations, and they're returning because of our efforts. So we're excited to be bringing the youth nationals and Olympic trials back in June. Uh, and then looking into 2019, some more NCAA events with Grand Valley State University, uh, as well as Calvin again. Talking about our signature event in the Meyer State Games in Michigan, Eric Engelbarts and his team uh, have truly had an impact on our efforts of sports tourism. As you look at the growth of number of sports, uh, both combined after 2014 of winter games and summer games. 
uh, the direct visitor spending based on the participant level that we've seen. 2017, it merged with our bidding on and winning the opportunity to host the State Games of America. Uh, it was a significant planning process. Uh, it really was multiple partners throughout the community that came together and had this impact, uh, and a successful impact at that, uh, of 48 different sports, first week of August, nearly 12,000 athletes, and the key to that is a third of them, or almost 4,000, came from 47 different states in Canada uh, and brought, of course, their family members with them. And when you look at travel party size, that's nearly 30,000 people that came into Kent County uh, to participate in this week-long event. Opening ceremonies at Van Andel Arena was a sellout crowd, Athlete Village, uh, 13 sporting events at DeVos Place, and 5,000 hotel rooms and an estimated spending of $9.5 million. <coughs> Talk about the impact of the Art Band Sports Complex. Again, three years of operation through the $7.5 million investment. The unique thing about that is many different complexes of this nature are popping up across the country, municipally led. Uh, this uh, really had you know, 90 plus percent of private funding that helped develop this. And they were able to, we were able to do that because you invested in the Kent County, or in the West Michigan Sports <laughs> Commission, uh, and, and we existed to be able to carry that forward and drive that investment to build this complex. And uh, we continue to see the impact it has of bringing travel teams in, uh, and you should be proud of that effort, uh, again, going back to the creation of this organization. So the number of tournaments, number of teams, of course, being in a climate in Michigan, May, June, and July are kind of the, the months that we truly see uh, our gates uh, in overabundance of, of the fields full uh, and spectators and, and others coming through the gates. So in total, over the course of these three years of operation, uh, 51 <laughs> events, uh, nearly 2,000 teams, uh, total patrons when you combine the, the travel party of mom and dad, grandpa and grandma, uh, siblings, is almost 90,000 people uh, that have come into Kent County uh, because of this facility. Uh, so over 20,000 hotel room nights that we've tracked uh, over the course of these three, uh, three years of operation and $15 million in direct spending associated with those visitors. Again, Doug touched on the Grand Action Study that they partnered with uh, to really look at how do we level up this destination, uh, what kind of investment would it take, where does it make most sense, and one of the seven outcomes, of course, was enhancing or continuing to enhance our youth and amateur sport offerings and in the form of rectangle fields and, and what a rectangle multi-sport or multi-field uh, facility might bring in uh, through our efforts or through combined efforts in the community. We hired uh, Hunnan Strategic Partners to do that feasibility study. Uh, they've done similar studies throughout uh, the country and, uh, and, and come back with feedback for those communities. Uh, and, and we had a very frank conversation. We don't want them to tell us what we want to hear. We want them to basically let us know, does it make sense to continue to invest and put uh, a facility of this type into our community and they've told some communities it doesn't make sense uh, to make that kind of investment based on many factors. We've had a midpoint presentation uh, with them. Uh, they're doing further economic feasibility and cost analysis but the, the midpoint presentation identified it does make sense to bring a 12 to 14 multi-purpose complex in. Of course, rectangular fields can accommodate soccer, lacrosse, rugby, ultimate, flag football, field hockey. Uh, you see in the lower right hand corner, uh, they sourced out national participation in what sports are on the rise, with soccer still being one of those and the number of participants uh, that exist, uh, but also ultimate frisbee, uh, lacrosse, rugby, showing increased numbers, and the other sports uh, really holding strong in, in youth participation in those sports. Now this next slide may not uh, have as much weight uh, given uh, Commissioner Mass' uh, um, question, but, but <coughs> Michigan Sports does continue to be a very strong brand and resonates outside of the state of Michigan of bringing visitors into our community. 
we hear consistently as we go out to different trade shows and talk to our peer set um, about the branding and the Pure Michigan campaign and, and how awesome they think it is and we're fortunate to have that. Uh, and so we've partnered with Travel Michigan, 12 other destinations as we go outside of the state to promote Michigan through the Pure Michigan brand uh, and have created Pure Michigan Sports to really focus on some of these different national sports governing bodies to really look at Michigan and then the gloves come off and we all kind of fight for that business. Uh, so we're excited with, with that. Um, again, it's, it's timely. I know, again, uh, through your budget process, the West Michigan Sports Commission has, has come up. Uh, I think, you know, through the impact that we've had to date, through your investment, uh, and really what we truly believe can happen over the next 10 years, uh, that it, it's a worthwhile investment by the Kent County Board of Commissioners. So with that, thank you very much again for your investment, uh, for the time this morning. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mike. Uh, we're going to, I know we have a few questions. We'll start with Commissioner Wardeeds. Thank you, Chair Softfeld. Uh, good morning, Mike. I think it was about 10 years ago when Wayman Britt uh, stood at that podium and said uh, that, told us that uh, uh, amateur sports and sports tourism is a $1.3 billion business. And I said, yeah, I think the point three is the Voorhees family. Uh, we, our granddaughters uh, in their high school but then into their collegiate volleyball uh, tournaments and our grandsons in the basketball world. Uh, we've traveled the state, the states and the world uh, to be a part of what they're doing. And this is the Sports Commission and we got to be so thankful to Peter Secchia for his input, influence and, and, and guidance in it, but has been really fantastic. I've had the honor now, I think it's eight years that have been on the board, and, and bringing you on board, Mike, was one of the great things that has brought success uh, to our sports commission. You and the team, uh, much to be excited about. But uh, amateur sports, that's just good West Michigan uh, through our family enjoyment, and thank you for your work. Thank you. Commissioner Stepp. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Mike. Good morning. Um, you know, Michigan's a four-season state, and I, I'm just wondering, um, are we able to put on credible programming for winter sports, particularly hockey? I mean, this is kind of a hockey community, too, and I don't yet see that um, in the structure. Yeah, I didn't highlight that, but uh, the number of hockey tournaments has just continued to grow, and the number of organizations putting on youth travel hockey tournaments. I talked to families, and my kids have not been in, involved in travel hockey, but they say steer clear of it, yet the numbers <laughs> continue to grow. It's a huge investment, uh, and families continue to invest. And, uh, and, and it's almost a cult following. Uh, but we have no less than six organizations on our event calendar putting on these various hockey tournaments over the course of 12 sheets of ice. And, uh, and so hockey definitely is a huge player in our mix of business. Uh, beyond that, you know, indoor facilities, whether they're our area high schools, which you know, seem like many colleges in many facets, when you look at uh, you know, what they have to offer, um, our partnership with our area colleges and universities, and some of the uh, for-profit venues that, that offer an opportunity to bring events into are all partners. And so you know, they offer uh, pickleball uh, is a fast and growing opportunity. Uh, volleyball, basketball, uh, you know, the, the opportunity for winter sports and indoor sports uh, is equal to the outdoor sports. So there's no question there's an impact. Thank you. Commissioner Antor. Thank you, Chair. Hey, Mike, congratulations, along with Doug, great numbers. Um, a few weeks ago, I was listening to Tom Izzo, uh, radio program. He was just gushing about West Michigan and Grand Rapids and hosting that basketball game. I think they played Georgia uh, at the arena. And I'm just wondering if, if with the hotel rooms that we've added and so forth, is there any chance we could harness his enthusiasm and, and continue on our quest to try to get Division I um, regional games here, or are we still a little short infrastructurally? Uh, infrastructure, there's still some challenges, but I think uh, certainly there's another shot in the arm when you look at uh, how quickly the sales went for the Georgia MSU game, how much people embrace that. Uh, there's no question it would be successful in this community. Uh, Infrastructure-wise, we've toured NCAA through our venues, and I know that the CAA is looking at some of this infrastructure specific to the locker rooms, 
Uh, when you talk about the, the height of these basketball players, the shower heads, uh, it can be a challenge. Uh, the cable baskets that run through the corridors are lower than they should be. And then the back of the house space, quite honestly, for their media partners, for the bands, uh, for the cheer teams, are less than what other venues offer. And that's, that's a bit of our shortfalling. Um, but again, you know, when you look at the impact it's had, uh, it's worth taking another look at. Well, Izzel would definitely fit underneath the shower. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Again, very pleased to be part of the West Michigan Sports Commission Board. Really enjoy everything that we're doing and the great additions we're potentially proposing to the community. The Rectangle Fields is a significant potential project. And I think that would be a great addition to come to our community and add more depth yet. Uh, speaking of winter games, I assume we will have our winter games again? Yeah, absolutely. Eric uh, Engelbart and his team are actively working on that. And, uh, you know, it certainly extends the brand of our Meyer State games in Michigan and, you know, offers, you know, again, we, we're in Michigan. Uh, we do have winter and we have to embrace it, so it offers those opportunities. And the last thing I'll add, they do have an annual uh, event with a luncheon speaker, and we are always open to suggestions, help when it comes to finding speakers. We've done a great job bringing some very notable names to that luncheon, so if anyone does have maybe some additional connections, if you'd like to participate and help out, feel free to contact me after the meeting and Maybe we can connect some extra dots to get some additional depth to our speaker list. And Wednesday, May 2nd, is our 12th annual. Uh, coach John Beeline, U of M uh, head basketball coach, thank you, Wayman Britt, for the contact and helping <laughs> us secure Coach Beeline. Coming back after 10 years, he was our second annual speaker, uh, and you all get invitations. We'd love to have you be present. Who, for that. who is that? <laughs> It'll be at the. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Coach a Big Ten championship team. Uh, <laughs> coach, thanks. Coach. Uh, uh, Fisher Pondstein. Thank you, Chair Saulfeld. Mike, thanks for everything you do. And like most of my questions, this one's loaded too, so if you want to answer it to me someday in your office, that'd be fine. But everything seems to be clicking with the economy, the state of Michigan, where we were a decade ago. Travels up, tourism up, everything, which benefits sports commissions. So with the investments that we've made into the infrastructure, do we look at or has someone looked at that you know, there's going to be another economic downturn? Will it be as bad as the housing crisis or anything that's happened before? How do we position ourselves to make sure that if that ever happens again, that the infrastructure that we have will still be used, still be drawing people in? more on a, on a bigger picture, and I, and I know that is loaded. Well, it, it is, but there's an easy answer to it, and it, it's a common theme throughout our industry when we look at the National Association of Sports Commissions and the work they do with Ohio University uh, and their sport management program and the measurements that are done in an economic calculator. <coughs> what they found uh, in a down economy, and, and remember, we were formed in 2007. Seven. And you look at the numbers, and they've grown from 2007, 8, 9, 10, 11, uh, is, is youth and amateur sports and families and parents want to use their discretionary dollars, even in those down economies, for the benefit of their kids. They want their kids active. They don't want them sitting in front of the TV, and, and they want them out in sport. And sport offers so much uh, to so many you know, different kids as pathways and opportunities uh, that, that it does show a benefit. And so even in a down economy, well, maybe we won't see the same growth. Families are still traveling. They're doing what they call mini vacations, and they're going across the state or you know, in a nearby community and making an experience of it to support their children. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Morgan. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Hey, my um, question, kind of following up on Commissioner Ponstein, um, the infrastructure, I'm interested in your strategic directive that you of the new sport infrastructure. Now, we have the complex, uh, the Art Van complex. Does that have room up there to facilitate the rectangular field you're talking about, or are you looking at other locations? So it, we have a facility needs committee that continues to carry forward this, this strategic directive. And we've certainly looked at the Art Van sports complex. You know, we have 
79 acres we purchased from the county, um, you know, very favorably and, and appreciate that. Uh, we built on 62 of those, so there is some land available, uh, but the acreage that is required for a rectangle field, uh, when you add other infrastructure and parking, is about five acres per field. So we wouldn't be able to put, uh, when you talk about contiguous fields and the impact it can have uh, on a tournament and success of a tournament and, and driving as a destination, uh, the number of fields that we're talking about. So we'd have to look at you know, a different land and, and different opportunities. But one thing we found going through this process is you know, Kent County, uh, getting around Kent County, although we're seeing our population increase, we're seeing that on the roads and the, the traffic volume, uh, it's still pretty easy to get around. And where our hotels are at, it will have people traveling from M6 all the way up to Rockford. So I think we can find some land in partnerships to really um, be suitable for a complex of this nature and, and still work with the, the realm of what our ultimate goal is. Okay, I was just wondering about economies of scale and if there was enough room, but it doesn't. We still are, are looking at uh, you know additional impact that we could have up there and um, measure based on the field size and uh, volume of use of what else do we do up there. Okay, thank you. I see no other questions. Oh, Commissioner Malcolm. Very quick last comment. I'll just add it quickly. I saw on your last slide that you were uh, addressing some of the different um, sports, and uh, not everyone knows me real well, but I am not a I like sports, but I'm probably not one that's um, going to go out of my way to, to watch too much of anything. But in case you would all like to know, the sport of Quidditch is alive and well. Uh, and I have been to one, and I'm guessing that there's probably not anyone else that's sitting around here that has a chance. I went to the um, International Quidditch um, Games or whatever in, uh, in Virginia, and um, wow. They were from Hawaii, from overseas, from Canada. I had no idea, but it is alive and well. Does everyone know what Quidditch is? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. It's, it's like tackle Potter football. Isn't it? Harry Potter. It's oh. Potter. Okay. It's, it's Harry Potter. It's Harry Potter. Potter. It's Harry Potter. And, must must be a University of Michigan thing. Yeah. Anyway, I just... Oh. Yeah, there's oh. clubs, <laughs> and, and it's a physical sport, um, <laughs> you know, but it's, uh, it's growing. Anyway, so, it's, I just uh, wanted to note that, that well, probably... When One we build this complex and bring the Quidditch beautiful. match in. You can bring Quidditch and I will come and watch. Sure. Anyway, thank you for your work. I would love to be sure that you are. You could for Okay, well, Mike, thank you so much again for a very informative presentation and uh, many success. Keep up the good work. Appreciate it. Okay, we'll move next to agenda item number six, which is public comments. Uh, we have three minutes. If there's any public comment this morning, please come forward and uh, state your name and your address. I'm not seeing anybody. So we will move to agenda item number seven, which is the consent agenda. And I will call on Commissioner Stack. Thank you, Chair. I move for approval of the consent agenda, which includes two uh, important resolutions, Resolution 85 and 86. Support. Support by Commissioner Korndike. Are there questions or comments on this? Now, um, one of these items, is this correct? Is, are these? Yeah. Yes, the closed session minutes. Okay, you have these closed session minutes. Uh, has everybody had a chance to review those? Nope. If not, go back. Please, let's take a moment here, open okay. those up, take okay. a look at those. We are approving those here. Relax. 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 Yeah, I'm just going to abstain from the entirety because of the senior marriage stuff. But I think my vote will be needed to pass the second. I wonder. But still, she's notified. She's going to to touch on the scene. You need to stand for the scene in the middle because there is disability and all other kids get money from that. Well, it's not, it's not a consent. No, it's part of the consent agenda. So he's either got to pull this apart. Oh, she's staying on the whole thing. I see. Yeah. Right. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Just to make it. I see. 
We'll give you another few minutes and then we will uh, vote on agenda item seven, which is the consent agenda. Okay, is there any questions or comments on the consent agenda? Commissioner Bukowski has advised that he will be abstaining due to a potential conflict with the senior village element of the consent agenda. I see none, so I will call on Madam Clerk for roll call. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On the motion to adopt the consent agenda, Commissioners Womack. Yay. Voorhees. Yes. Vonk. Yes. Talon. Yes. Steck. Yes. Skaggs. Yes. Ponstein. Yes. Morgan. Yes. Melton. Yes. Mast. Yes. Corndike. Yes. Coleman. Yes. Jones. Yes. Hennessy. Yes. Bulkowski. Abstain. Commissioners Breeby. Yes. Vice Chair Bolter. Yes. Commissioner Antor. Yes. Chair Salfeld. Yes. Mr. Chair, you have 18 yeas, one abstention, zero nays. The motion passes. The consent agenda is adopted. Thank you, and uh, those uh, closed session minutes will be collected uh, for you and the meeting today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we move then to agenda item number eight, which is our resolutions. And today we just have one, and I will call on Commissioner Bordes. Thank you, Chair Saulfeld. I would move resolution 87 of 11-9-17. It's from the Kent County Refuse Disposal System refunding bonds of the series 2017 for the public works. Support, support by Commissioner Corndown. Questions or con uh, comments on this resolution, I proposed resolution. I am seeing none. This is a roll call vote, so I will call on Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On the motion to adopt resolution 87, Commissioners Womack. Yes. Voorhees. Yes. Vonk. Yes. Talon. Yes. Steck. Yes. Skaggs. Yes. Ponstein. Yes. Morgan. Yes. Melton. Yes. Mast. Yes. Corndike. Yes. Coleman. Yes. Jones. Yes. Hennessy. Yes. Bulkowski. Yes. Breeby. Yes. Vice Chair Bolter. Yes. Commissioner Antor. Yes. Chair Saulfeld. Yes. Mr. Chair, you have 19 yeas, zero nays. The motion passes. Resolution 87 is adopted. Thank you. We move then to agenda item number nine, which is public comment. This is a one minute public comment. If there's any public comment, please come forward. I am not seeing any, so, so we will move to agenda item number 10, which are our reports. Are there any reports this morning? Commissioner Jones. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to give the group the update at the Grand Valley Metro Council board meeting that happened on November 2nd. They did hire a communications plan that they're going to map out how to improve their communications which I think is a really good idea I supported that and they are hiring a firm to get a plan together so I just wanted to let the board know that they've identified that as an area that needs some evaluation and they they did hire uh, Truscott Rossman to do that thanks okay Commissioner Morgan Thanks, Mr. Chair. I'd like to invite everybody out to the airport for the Veterans Welcoming Center dedication, 1230. Hope to see you there. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Commissioner Breedy. Thank you, Chair. I um, just wanted to invite everyone to our LED task force meeting next week. It's on Wednesday. It will be at the Health Department at 1 o'clock. And um, we're wrapping up our um, findings and we'll come out with our um, report. Um, early December and then um, one of the things I just wanted to know you know the lead task force we're working hard on our recommendations and um, the report will include opportunities um, for education in all areas um, you know for families parents um, in the medical community and also um, you know landlords and tenants people who will be working on um, homes because you know as we know there's been an increase um, again in the 2016 numbers in children affected um, by lead and you know just to note too that increase um, every so often there's blips of increases um, from time to time and 
over the past several years, there have been some major improvements in how we handle lead in our community that have really reduced the numbers of kids that are affected by lead. Um, so, you know, we have 615 children in Kent County, and several of those kids reside in three zip codes with 49507 um, having a, you know, a large amount of children affected. So, you know, we'll come up with our report and um, we'll have several opportunities to continue the involvement in our community and to continue educating people and also um, provide um, programs and, um, you know, hopefully have some additional available funding to, to assist in um, the reduction of lead. Very good. Uh, Commissioner Poundstein. Thank you, Chair Saulfeld. Uh, I'll, I'll try to keep this brief. Uh, had a Mac Board of Directors meeting Tuesday. The governor came to speak to us. Uh, he passed out this brochure. There's a copy of it that Pam and her staff have made to give it to you. It's just labeled a path toward our future. It kind of gives you a highlight where we've been, where we're going. Uh, I don't think anyone can dispute the love that <coughs> Governor Snyder has for this state, and it's all of the state. He's constantly promoting it from businesses, tourism, and on up. So you know, I really appreciate that. Wayman mentioned about revenue sharing. Uh, the governor said that there's not a day that he doesn't run into a county official that reminds him of that. And I think over his tenure as governor, he has learned what counties do and what the importance are. Having said that, um, coming online is the road tax funding and infrastructure and that's about 1.2 billion dollars and that should start to be fed to the counties the problem is a lot of that money is coming out of the general fund so the next few years he's cautioning that budgets will be tight uh, the personal property tax he, he did bring that up that was one of our questions um, yes there's something's going to be done the way the money is being distributed he did guarantee to us, though, that any money that has been distributed, the state is not going to ask for any of that back. That's already been done. Going forward, yes, more exemptions are coming online, but it's over. still going to be over $100 million in that fund, uh, but they are going to work on a more fair, equitable way to distribute those funds. Um, one of the things that he highlighted, he seems to be really big into broadband. Uh, that's something that he really wants to work on it. I, you know, I think he sees that his, his term's going to be up shortly. Uh, AT&T, I know, has stepped forward, said that they want to work to get that into rural areas. Uh, Snyder said he's going to try to hold them to the feet of that, but he said we also can't stop looking for better ways of doing it. And one of the greatest growth areas right now for broadband is in a little spot in northern Upper Peninsula, that's the top part of our mitten. Uh, Northern Michigan University has taken over expanding broadband, not into their campus area, but they're expanding it out into small towns. I'm going to try to get more information on what all they're doing up there, uh, but according to the governor, they are doubling the size of broadband up into that area of the UP. Uh, finally, he, he did not mention pensions. He's well aware that all counties are not the same. Uh, the problem with the pensions is that a lot of the counties are in trouble. The problem is the bottom five are in really big trouble. So something's got to be addressed. Hopefully that can be looked at, but th that's going to be something that's going to remain on the radar. Uh, after the governor left, Matt gave us a brief update on some things. Uh, the dead stores issue, uh, not dead stores, yeah, it is dead, but the dark stores issue is pretty much dead. Um, as, as long as the committee chair is the committee chair, that's never going to go anywhere. So the only hope, and it has been kicked back down to the lower court, courts of the tax tribunal. So we'll just keep our fingers crossed, but the solution to that might be a year, year and a half out. Uh, another thing they brought up, I don't know if anyone else read, but the state of Wisconsin, all the counties have joined together on an opioid lawsuits. And there's a lot of people that, that are on the list that they think that our potential for lawsuits. I know I get emails, I know we had something in our mailbox of law firms looking for class action lawsuits on that. There's a lot of good law firms and there's a lot of bad ones. Uh, I think Wisconsin's going to be represented uh, by a firm out of Texas. The, the, the key issue here and why counties are taking a look at this, if you remember the tobacco lawsuit, that was taken on by the states. 
So when that settlement occurred, all those monies went to the states. And the counties <laughs> felt that a lot of those expenses due to tobacco were burdened by the county and they weren't reimbursed more uh, fairly. So the thought here is, especially in Wisconsin, is that the county should be the first one in line if there's any type of settlement on, on what we can do for the costs that we've incurred. Uh, the other issue quickly, the TIF reform. Uh, if, if it's gonna happen, they don't know who's gonna do it. The Treasury Department's really interested in it, but the word on the street is that they're understaffed and just don't have the time. If, if it looks like there's gonna be any movement on any reforms in that area, it looks like the Michigan Economic Development Corporation will, will be the one spearheading that if any solutions can be reached. And then finally, uh, MAC is very active with the offices a block from the state capitol. Uh, the lobbying efforts on behalf of not only Kent County but all counties uh, is run by the lobbyists that, that, that we have. And there's costs that are incurred there. So in the next couple weeks, you're going to be getting a fundraising letter for the MAC PAC. They're going in a little bit different directions. Not everyone could shell it out. But hopefully they're going to send a letter asking for each county commissioner in the state of Michigan to donate $18 for the year 2018 to that fund. That's it. Thanks. Thank you for that report. Uh, Commissioner Talon. Thank you, Chair. The Grand Rapids DDA board met yesterday. Wanted to uh, share a couple items from that with you. Um, first, um, I hear, I have a lot of people ask me, what's happening? Is that Grand River restoration thing still happening? And I, I think it is a little bit behind the scenes, but there is just a ton of work going on about um, what's going to happen in the river, the permitting processes that, that uh, need to be completed. Related to that was an item on the DDA agenda yesterday, um, the Lyons Square project, which is the end of Lyons Street, kind of outside of Wolfgang Puck along the river there. It's kind of a well-worn out uh, area. It's actually a city park. That actually is going to be one of, is, is expected to be one of the primary putting in and taking out points um, resulting from the Grand River restoration. So there's a lot of design work being done uh, related to that and uh, we needed to um, allocate a little bit more resources because of the work that now needs to be done in the water because there will be some significant um, piers and other things out of the water um, coming out from uh, Lion Square there. In interesting project, so keep your eyes uh, open to that. The other uh, significant thing that happened was um, accepting with regret the resignation of Chris Larson as the executive director effective tomorrow. Um, when Chris was hired five years ago, a lot of us said, we'll be lucky if we have him here for three years. We had him for five. Um, and he probably wouldn't have left if it wasn't his hometown calling him to do similar work to what he's doing here. So we're going to miss him. Plans are being put into place um, for transition. Um, so um, I'll keep you posted on that. Interesting hearing about uh, winter sports. And one of the, the things I learned is that there's a lot of pressure on uh, Rosa Park Circle in the winter. Um, the competition of recreational use of that park and sports use of that park. And one of the things that DGRI is looking at is putting an, an additional facility in Hartside Park, which is close to the downtown market, for about a month uh, during the month of February. And um, that, would, that would be used for recreational, for sporting type activities to take some of that pressure off of Rosa Park Circle so it can be used more for um, figure skating and, and those kinds of uh, personal uh, recreation activities. Wanted to have you mark your calendar if you haven't heard about an appreciation reception for Grand Action on November 20. Experience Grand Rapids is involved with that. Um, I, I assume we'll be getting more details but you can put that on your calendar. And then lastly, a little different information than, than Stan reported. Um, we were told that Senator Horn has reinduced, reintroduced <coughs> TIF legislation um, at, at the state, and um, it's, it, it's fairly minor in the kinds of changes that it proposes, mostly about transparency, but thought 
um, as a county, we have interest in that. We ought to be aware of that legislation being reintroduced um, and pay attention to what's going on there. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Stack. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the Lakeshore Regional Entity Executive Board met for about three hours yesterday exploring uh, the best sense we have on the financial uh, performance of the entity over the course of 2017 fiscal year. It's our best sense that uh, it will have operated at a deficit of about $18 million. Um, fortunately, though, that's just uh, short of where we would have to be requesting contributions from the CMH members. So uh, that's the good news. Um, but it will leave the LRE and all of behavioral health funding in this region pretty challenged uh, for next year. So it's not going to be an easy year at all. Uh, there is some additional funding, uh, but for example, uh, we have about six to eight million dollars additional funds uh, to help us with the increases in the direct care wage that's nice uh, but the the regulatory requirements on spending that money is so onerous um, that a number of our providers will simply decline it um, it is uh, it's just you have to account for every individual who will be receiving that and of course many of the agencies that receive that will only get it for Medicaid services not for other services which leaves them having to come up with funding from their other sources in order to match that or they have employees earning different amounts for different jobs so uh, it's unfortunate it's a great idea but I don't think it's gonna at the end of the day help us a whole lot stay tuned Okay. any other reports I see none so we move to it I no, miscellaneous. Oh, okay. Then we will move to item 11, miscellaneous, and I'll call on Commissioner Borgie. Uh, in my complimentary comments about the Sports Commission, I would like to add to that the appreciation of our local businesses on their investment in the Sports Commission and uh, the Meyer family in particular for their year after year support. So thanks to our business community and uh, uh, their support of the Sports Commission. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ponstein. Thank you, Chair Saulfeld. Uh, I love the world of politics and everything that's involved into it. In fact, I think that has become kind of an unhealthy obsession for me. So I just want to thank the clerk staff and everyone. Uh, I've never seen election results come back as quick, the format that, that it's in. And, you know, my hat's off to the whole county and the people that are responsible for that. Uh, it was, it was a great, great change of pace. Uh, also, um, one, one, one thing the governor did say at the, at the meeting uh, is that when he looks at development in the state of Michigan, he calls himself a nerd, he did this too. And I just invite everyone to maybe download this app, is that any project or development he sees, and this is kind of a different take on development, is that he uses this app called Walk Score. And it bases the development and, and anything that happens on the ability for people to leave their house and walk to cultural, to work, and to the store and stuff like that. It's a very interesting app. Um, I've, I've kind of crossed out a couple hours in a day to try to do it on my phone. Uh, but it's something that, that, that he uses, so I'm sure it's going to be a little bit different than the norm. Very good. Uh, Commissioner Bukowski. Um, a couple of quick things. Um, thank you all for the support on the rapid millage. Um, it, if you didn't see the results, it was a 61.4% yes vote. Um, the excel, excellent underlying news is it passed in five of the six cities. It doesn't have to pass in, in individual ones, but it did. Um, we'll continue to work with our friend, uh, Commissioner Steck in Walker, where it narrowly was defeated. Um, and uh, we'll continue to those of you who didn't support the millage, I, I still want to continue to have chats because we need to continue to be innovative on how we do things because you can't get to Meyer Garden from here um, unless you pack a lunch and a few tents for your, your two-day walk. Um, on the voting stuff, I know the clerk is committed to continuing to work on accessibility. Um, there were like mixed results most of them were very positive there were some issues but we'll continue to focus on the accessibility of voting for um, voters with disabilities and last but not least I don't think it's on the experience Grand Rapids website quite yet but there is um, 
a musical this weekend at City High. They're doing Fiddler on the Roof, and there might be a cameo appearance by a county commissioner. Mm -hmm. So, um, Rabbi Bolkowski. We'll just say that. <laughs> <laughs> so look for that. Tickets are still on sale. Come support City High. Thank you. By the way, my Google map says you can walk from here to Meyer Garden in one hour and 51 minutes. There you go. Okay. Well, let's do it one day. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Jones. Thank you, Chair. Just wanted to extend a congratulations to Rockford High School's band that won their Flight 1 state titles at Ford Field last weekend. There were 12 bands that competed, and it was the first time in over 24 years that the state title and that flight has come back to West Michigan. So good for them. I, of course, was there and was pleased to cheer them on, and it was just a great win. Plus, we have our uh, coming up is our wine, beer, food event, right? Right around the corner. So uh, if you guys are looking for things to do, it's never boring in Kent County. Thanks. Commissioner Stack. Thank you, Chair. So speaking of elections in Walker, um, congratulations to our own Melinda Gruders, um, who won her seat on the City Commission in the City of Walker. Uh, I'm very pleased about that, one, because I know her, uh, two, because she'll be representing me in my ward, and, and three, because she is replacing someone I truly love, um, which is my wife, who sat in that seat for 16 years. Uh, Commissioner Mans. I just want to remind people, Veterans Day is Saturday. There's the Veterans Day, the annual parade, or the semi-annual parade. The lineup is 1030 on Lyon and Monroe, roughly, and then it's down Monroe, up, up to up, uh, Fulton, uh, to the Veterans Park. The Veterans Park is undergoing a major renovation, just an enhancement in it. Uh, it's going to be ready. People, I, I've heard that people are working virtually uh, through the rain to get it all ready, so it'll be a Good time to come down and uh, and see the remembrance uh, ceremony is what it's going to be called. A little ceremony at 11 o'clock. Uh, the forecast is not rain. It's going to be kind of in the 30s though, so it's going to be a little cold. So I, I intend to go and uh, hopefully see, see some of you there. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Womack. Yes, I just want to um, reaffirm something I said earlier in the week at a. <laughs> finance meeting for the commission that living in the 49507 zip code I am alarmed that we have more lead poisoning in that community than Flint. I also want to say um, after further reviews that I believe it was Commissioner Antor that was, was correct earlier this week when he stated that there's a lot more testing done in that zip code. Um, the zip codes with the, that are experiencing more lead and find out they have poisoning, there's a lot more testing going on in those zip codes. And some of the other zip codes, um, only 31% of the kids zero to five years old have been tested. And that's even some of that going on in, Grand, in the 49507. But those, the more uh, testing they do of kids that will make it a little higher than other areas that aren't testing, but lead continues to be a problem. So I hope um, after the task force reports back, uh, I want to commend them on their hard work, that we are proactive in 2018 to do as much as we can to help with that problem. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, and that zip code was a reason we set up the task force, so hopefully we'll get some, some help on that area. Uh, Commissioner Melton. Thank you, Chair. Um, two quick things. I um, wanted to make certain that all of us know we have a uh, celebrity among us. Um, my husband and I and, and uh, Harold Mast was there uh, to see Stan Steck receive his award. Um, and having that known a lot about what it is, um, I don't mind telling you that uh, we are comprised of quite an amazing group of people here um, as Kent County Commissioners and we forget sitting here, or it's easy to forget sitting here, that we all have a second or third place or job or occupation and Stan Steck was um, recognized uh, um, quite highly for his uh, volunteer work that he does with persons uh, who need legal assistance and are not able to get it on their own. Um, and I just, 
that's an area so warm to my heart, Stan, and I just, uh, it was an honor to be there, and it's an honor to know you and to work with you on the, on the commission board. Um, what a wonderful thing that you do outside of, of all the other hats that you wear. Um, so that Thank was you. one. The second one is I um, was actually asked to be on the committee to choose the Veteran of the Year Award and therefore went to the dinner, which was just this past Saturday. Um, I, again, didn't really know what to expect. Um, and I guess I really would like to see more uh, uh, commissioners get involved. And I know we do a lot of other things. I've been to more um, galas and fundraisers than I ever knew was possible. But this one is um, near and dear to my heart. Uh, freedom is not free. Uh, it comes definitely with a price. Um, and the new uh, uh, veteran of the year is Deacon Leo Ferguson. It's chosen, um, and again, I don't, having just done it once, I can't tell you I know it well, but they submit things, all the different posts submit a person, and this particular gentleman spends at least 30 hours a week going into uh, veterans' homes, the veteran home, the veterans' homes, and, and actually partners right alongside them as they work through some of their different uh, struggles, um, some of the different financial, mental, emotional, and physical struggles that they might have. So he no longer serves his country with uh, his uniform on, but he certainly is continuing that service. Um, and they have a um, uh, guest speaker, his name is Steve Prince. He represents Warriors Set Free, and again, it is a group, it's a ministry that uh, reaches out to persons mostly with PTSS, PTSD, I guess there's a there's a change in, in the letters, um, and he, um, they just, it's, they just become your partner. So I really encourage all, everyone to get to know more about it. I know I certainly was not very aware, and um, it was quite an evening. Um, Thank you, Commissioner Melton. Um, I just have a few things. One of them I was going to say something about uh, Commissioner Steck's award. It is very impressive, providing uh, free legal service to people in need in the community. I have no doubt he would extend that same courteous to all of us here. <laughs> um, secondly, note our next meeting is not in two weeks, it's in three weeks on November 30 due to Thanksgiving. And uh, the day before that, in the evening at 6 p.m., is the uh, GOP caucus meeting, which is an open meeting it's due to our size uh, at the Kent County headquarters. So make sure you have that on your note, on your uh, calendar if you want to. Attend. Finally, uh, we did have a meeting of the subcommittee of the county administrator controller uh, <coughs> group this morning to uh, regarding the permanent replacement. Uh, some pretty important dates were established at that meeting, uh, so let me go through those. First of all, uh, just so you know, we did receive the uh, list of candidates that had uh, applied, and we have the uh, search firms, uh, if you will final uh, finalist in their opinion uh, that were provided to us. The next step is that the subcommittee is going to be doing some interviews on uh, November 27th if mid after mid morning to mid afternoon. If you want to attend that you obviously can but you don't need to uh, necessarily attend that because then what's going to happen is on January uh, 10th there's going to be a uh, public forum uh, in the evening and then the next day we will have uh, right now we're scheduled to have a board meeting I got to work with uh, county staff to figure out if that meeting date stays but regardless we're going to have the that's going to be the day that late morning probably around 10 o'clock following the meeting if we have a meeting that would be when we would as a commission have an opportunity to interview the final candidates the commission will provide feedback and then the committee will have a final meeting that afternoon to submit a recommendation to the board so if all goes as planned in the second meeting of January is when we would probably be voting 
on this issue. We'll send out something in writing to memorialize these dates and stuff here shortly, but I just wanted to give you that update.